Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Matt McHale. Uh, I work at Google, I'm what's called the head of mid-market acceleration. I am going to invite my new friend Shimona from Shopify to come up stage and come up here and join me. So for those of you who are familiar hopefully with Shopify, um, you know that we're an e-commerce platform. We've been around since about 2007. You know, we went public a couple years ago. We've got 600,000 merchants on our platform. And Shopify Plus was really born as an experiment actually of Shopify's about four years ago. And it came out of this need of watching our merchants, you know, who maybe started as, you know, little mom and pops and that started to grow up on our platform. and you know, through their size and through their complexity, you know, their needs started to evolve. And rather than them having to go through all of the pain of a migration, if any of you have ever done a platform migration of any kind, you know that's horrible. <laughs> you know, rather than having to, to go through something like that, like why, why would they have to leave? You know, why do they have to go to, you know, a, a Magento or a Hybris or something? Why couldn't we just be the place that they could be from cradle to, you know, growth? I do this thing that we made up, actually. It's called Revenue Acceleration, and no one actually ever knows what it is because we literally made it up six months ago. Um, if you, any of you are in sales, you know that the kind of the traditional role of a sales leader is to you know, deliver on the plan, right? Execute and give us the forecast, deliver on that, that quota. Um, Shopify is just growing so crazy right now that that is all consuming and there would be no time, mind space or thought or resources put into thinking about the future. My entire job is to think about 2019 and beyond. So my job is to think about how we're going to continue to transform our revenue model through efficiency, through optimization and crazy experiments for the future. Awesome. Fair? Uh, very fair. So awesome. I, I think everyone here should be super proud that one of the most innovative companies in the e-commerce space is headquartered in Ottawa, huge office right over here, yeah. um, that you could be a port of pride for Canada. So appreciate you being here. Um, so we'll start macro. So just three key trends that are shaping the future of e-com. I mean, it really starts with, and it was such a great setup for you, Matt, but um, consumer behavior. You know, consumer behavior is shifting. The way that consumers are buying is shifting, and it's shifting fast, right? The channels that they buy in, you know, digital wallets, you know, again, reducing that friction, that time to purchase, wanting a relationship with their brands. So consumer behavior truly is driving everything, and consumers really expect you to deliver the experience that they're looking for. And from that really comes kind of like the O to O, if you guys have seen it. You know, that convergence of online and offline. We've all heard it a million times. You know, retail is dead, or, you know, hey, no, retail's, you know, retail's still alive, it's not dead. Retail isn't dead, it's just changing, and it's shifting. And the ones that are thriving are the ones that are willing to thrive and you know shift and change with it, you know. So we see this you know mass you know uh, rush of you know traditional retailers that are going and moving online and trying to figure out this whole thing, um, and it's really about now again starting to understand your consumers, creating those relationships, you know, really building your brand through that experience. But the other one, of course, is um, is D to C, you know. What we're seeing today, you know, some of the fastest growing merchants online you know, didn't even exist four or five years ago. You know, Fashion Nova didn't exist four years ago. Kylie just came online a couple of years ago. And these are some of the fastest growing merchants in the world. You know, what Kylie did, if you guys all saw the Forbes article uh, a couple of days ago, you know, what Kylie's done in the last couple of years, it took Nike 20 years to do. That's how fast things are going. And that's because of reduced the friction. You know, traditional retail is changing. You can cutting out, you know, that wholesaler and distributor model and going direct to the consumer and trying and being able to experiment new and different things. So, and then my last little one as a little bonus, I know we'll talk about it later, is automation. That's huge and that's gonna be massive for especially for SMBs. So there's a lot of different size companies represented in the room. There's large companies or small companies and there's traditional brick and mortar, there's B2C, there's uh, e-com players. So yeah. can you give me an example of um, maybe a small or medium-sized business that's really doing a good job with e-com, that's competing against a more traditional, larger company with more money and just being scrappy and doing this right? Yeah, um, that word you used is amazing, scrappy. Um, and that's the reason that some of these smaller companies almost have an advantage. Um, you know, they have the ability to be nimble and to be agile and really like own their brand and own that relationship with the customer and own that data so that they better understand it. Um, you know, we take a look at, you know, those big marketplaces like in Amazon where their value prop, you actually said it is speed, right? What is the, what's the shortest distance between wanting and getting? 
you know, and that's that value prop. It's total commodity sales. But these small brands have the opportunity to create the relationship with their consumers. Um, Third Love is a great example. If any of you, any ladies, have you guys heard of Third Love? Yes. Guys, have you heard of Third Love? No. Well, we're going to talk about bras for a second then. <laughs> So Third Love's done this like fantastic job with this of really creating this customized relationship and making the consumer feel understood. You know, you go online to the Third Love site, which I know all of you are going to do after this, and you actually can take this quiz. And it's not just asking you like, "Hey, what's your size?" you know, in your band. They're actually asking you like, "Hey, are your are your straps really tight usually?" You know, like, "Do you do you hurt at the end of the day?" Guys, I know you resonate. You know, and you go through this quiz and out pops what are the right styles for you? What is your cup size really? You know, and, and what and recommendations for you? You know, and then you you can like click right through to purchase. But in order to get those results, you have to enter in your email address. So now we've got we've email, we've captured email. We're going to have great relevant messaging that they're going to be able to send out because we've got the we've got the data from them immediately, and your consumer feels understood because hey, they get me. They get what I need. They've done a fantastic job with something like that. Awesome. Good, great example. Mm -hmm. You mentioned B2C. Um, what other sort of new interesting business models do you see um, popping up in, in the e-com space? Yeah, uh, D2C is really interesting. Uh, sorry, I'm going to talk to the ladies again just for a moment. Uh, anyone know Tamara Mellon? Right, luxury. So she used to be with Jimmy Choo, you know, traditional retailer. She left. She started her own, like true, true, like luxury experience again. Um, and she tried to go the traditional route. She was in all the luxury retailers, you know, going through wholesale, and it really wasn't, you know, working well for her. Um, and so she decided to go completely different. She is fully online now. No more luxury retailers. She's cut out the middleman. This is luxury. Like you would never think that a true, true luxury brand would be able to do that. She's fully online now. What does that allow her? Agility. She can test something. She can, you know, test messaging. She can test a product. She can test, you know, how it resonates, and then turn it around like that. That and that's incredible. She's basically kind of become like the fast fashion, but for luxury which is amazing. And she's got a quote that I really like, which is, you know, um, the new retail on online is the death of wholesale, which is super interesting. You know, so she's really turned around that model and really been able to make something of it. Another one, though, I will say I'll shift for a second, actually, is like those, you know, traditional retailers that you would never would have thought, you know, would go D to C, um, like a Ford in Europe, you know, who's sell selling their parts, or like think of a Tesla. When would you ever have thought they'd be buying cars online? But now we're in a world that's like that. So I would say some of those, like those, those big, huge, that you never would have thought you'd be purchasing online, um, as well as those that are like just shifting and creating a brand new model like luxury. So obviously e-commerce uh, has given a lot of brands the opportunity to access the world's consumers mm. uh, and compete internationally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and grow their business internationally. So yeah. you know, talk a little bit about this, implications, opportunities from, yeah. from your lens. Yeah. Um, it's a question we get a lot. You know, is everyone's always trying to think about like, how do you go global? But really talking to our merchants about how to go global really has to start with where they're starting from. You know, it's a different conversation. There's no like magic formula to thinking about how you go global. Um, so if you think of, you know, as Australia as an example, when we talk to our merchants in Australia that are thinking about it, you know, they naturally, they have, a, they have a smaller market, right? So they naturally get to a point where they need to start to think about going global much sooner than a, you know, than a retailer that's online in the States that can probably think about staying domestic for a lot longer and not worry as quickly about going global. So the first and foremost, like the thoughts around how you think about going global really depend on where you're starting from. For Canada, I know, of course, we always think about these things. You know, Canada is small enough, and one of the things I really love about it is that it can be used as a testing ground. You know, it's small enough, it's agile enough, you can test with product. It's similar-ish enough to the U.S. that, you know, you can see and test and try things out before really fully moving to the U.S. But if it's online and you're D2C, you've got the agility to flex with it. You know, we saw... Um, you know, we've seen a lot of traditional retailers that have tried to do this, you know, make the move from the States up to Canada, you know, Target comes to mind, obviously, um, and they weren't agile and they weren't flexible. And so they didn't have the ability when they saw it going downhill to really pivot. And what do we see? We see a really quick exit. 
you know, that online, that D2C, they have the opportunity to try things out and be agile. Shifting gears back to some sort of smaller medium or medium sized business opportunities, you know, thinking about e-commerce as a way for the little guy, the little girl to compete, you know, do you have any good examples of that, that little one that just really kick in butt or any other, I mean, we talked a little bit about it before, yeah. but any other sort of principles that, you know, any business, no matter what the size, uh, can utilize in e-commerce? There's no one, you know, silver bullet to thinking about how you're going to win online. The silver bullet is the fact that you're small and you're nimble and you're agile. So, you know, you've got people like, and I'll talk about a couple of them, you've got Gymshark, which is such a fantastic example. You've got Fashion Nova, Kylie, Movement, you know, Thinks and Third Love are really great examples. Koala is a really great example as well. Um, you know, and, but they all did it through testing and trying and understanding their consumer um, through different levers. So, you know, uh, Gymshark is an example, fully through like social and, you know, developing relationships and, and creating a community. Um, Fashion Nova, that's SEO. <laughs> You know, who would have thought four years ago that the number one, you know, the search for fashion is going to result in Fashion Nova four years ago? That's amazing. Um, as well as influencers. You know, what they've done with like Cardi B and a few other influencers is absolutely incredible and solely online and almost completely through Instagram as well as their D2C. You know, you've got Thinks and you've got Third Love that, you know, we're able to find like a niche market that some of those more traditional lingerie, you know, like larger lingerie models weren't able to reach and get at really specific messaging and getting right at them and making them feel understood and making them feel welcome. And then Movement Watches is really like it's a straight D to C play. So cutting out that middleman and going direct to consumer and really being able to be agile and trying out, you know, a few different things. So these smaller brands have been trying different things. You've got Magnolia. They're not so small, but, you know, they've got a lot of entities. You know, they're able to test and play with AR, VR. So it's that agility to really play and try and test out different things. Um, that's the most important. So if there's a lesson that even like a larger brand sitting in the room can take from that is can you find some of your smaller brands or can you find a niche segment that you can start playing with and testing with, you know, that you could then potentially apply to, you know, the rest of your business. So automation from a Google perspective is one of the most important levers for e-commerce right now. Um, but I'm going to ask you to kind of help me out and, and make um, automation a little less esoteric. So can you give um, the folks in the room something to think about at a high level in terms of how they should be thinking about automation, um, but also maybe bring it down to the ground level and like tactically what could we all be doing differently to leverage automation day to day? Yeah. Um, automation is huge, and we talked about this a little, you know, at the beginning with, you know, some of the biggest trends in e-commerce today, because um, there's so much to do, you know, and we really have to ensure that especially, you know, like if you're small and you're nimble, that you're really able to focus on your revenue generating activities. So, you know, when we say automation, I know we would probably traditionally just think of like marketing automation and, and advertising and things like that. Um, at Shopify, though, we really think of it holistically, and we're thinking of like the realm of e-commerce automation, you know, to be able to automate automate and trigger, you know, and preload all the content, all the prices at the exact time that it needs to trigger for this specified period of time and then revert right back to normal when it's done. You know, I can't tell you how many merchants love the fact that they don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. anymore and manually do all of these things and then undo them, and especially for the entire world as BFCM, you know, really goes global. Um, and so really, those are things that, you know, we're working on today and we're thinking about because it should be about people focusing on revenue generating activities. Uh, but those honestly, like the way I see it, table stakes coming up soon. Like that's not, that's just going to be what, you know, is expected. Do you have any sort of pet peeves or any like con consistent, like wrong ways of thinking or mistakes people are making when they're thinking about e-com? Um, yeah, I, I'd say like my biggest pet peeve really is, is not taking any risks and moving too slowly. You know, the, the, the retailers, you know, when people talk, you know, have that whole retail is dead, you know, or retail is dying mentality, you know, those ones that are exiting and those are dying out are the ones that, you know, you know, didn't latch onto the vision and adapt fast enough. A, a great example, like we could talk about, let's talk about toys, you know, you've got FAO Schwartz, who decided to reinvent themselves and are doing a fantastic job. And on the other side, you've got Toys R Us, right? It's FAO Schwartz, one of the most iconic brands. They've been around forever. You know, so in theory, if retail was dying, should they have gone by ways as well? No, they just decided to latch onto a vision and think about how to reinvent themselves. And so those you know, that are starting to fall by the wayside are the ones that are not choosing to change fast enough. Okay. 
Um, I like the FAA Schwartz example because mm. it's not just sort of the scrappy startup that's doing no. e-com well, right? There's a lot of traditional folks that are really yeah. getting this right. Yeah. Google likes to point to Domino's Pizza as yeah. an example. You know, Great six, example. eight ways to order Domino's Pizza. They consider themselves a tech company that just happens to sell pizza. You know, um, do you have any other examples of a traditional like company um, firm that's that's really dug their heels and are doing a really good job? There's a lot that are starting to look at. Uh, some of you are in the room today, actually. That are, especially in some of our larger CPGs that are starting to peg, you know, some of their brands and pivot and create experimentation. So, hey, with like Lay's, let's start putting a face on a bag and see what happens and use that to really capture data about our customers and then be able to better target and create relationships with them. The ones that are doing a really, really fantastic job are the ones that are, you know, taking smaller brands and they're taking or they're taking niche spaces and being experimental and playing with them. Time to open up to you all, see if you have any questions for the very wise Shimona. So just want to know about what you see for the future of e-commerce and how itself is, Shopify itself is going to evolve as a platform. Um, yes, yeah, so let me ask, let me answer the first one first, your e-commerce, like under the future of e-commerce. Um, honestly, it's about staying really agile and, and quick to consumer behavior, and I know I've said that a lot of times, but um, if you're thinking like really pie in the sky stuff, um, like voice search is really huge, AR, VR is going to be absolutely massive. Um, those are two things to really think about for the future and start to prepare for. Um, and really just in being ready to capitalize on all the new channels that are going to continue to come up. Um, as we've all seen it, you know, like the pace of technology and the pace of these new channels that continue to come up, it's faster and faster and faster. So how are you going to ensure that you're ready to keep up with the pace? Because consumers are shifting their behavior, right? Like our attention went from Facebook over to Instagram very, very quickly. And so those who, you know, capitalize on one specific channel, you know, and aren't ready to move over to, say, Instagram, you know, are going to lose out. So it's about that flexibility. Um, um, but I would say it's really right now about optimizing for today while you think about and put resources towards like building for the long term. Just curious about uh, your thoughts on in terms of ROPO. So when people are researching online purchasing offline, what does that mean for a company that's 100% e-commerce now? Do we have to start opening retail uh, in, in that sense? Or can we just like leave that out entirely and just leave the ROPO for the people who are doing it uh, brick and mortar. So like your your question is, you know, traditional like true D to C like thinking yeah. about going and, and opening retail. Yeah. yeah um, and this is kind of like that O to O that I was talking about before, that kind of convergence of online and offline. That's not just kind of you know like the those that are offline moving online. The online, those D to C retailers, if what we see is they're actually opening and going, you know, like retail and brick and mortar, but not in the traditional sense, is to create experiences. And that's truly what you do, right? You know, it's, and that's about creating experiences for the customer to come in and really build a relationship with them, understand the brand, be able to touch and feel the brand, not necessarily in the same way that, you're, that you know, we would usually think, which is about like just another channel for volume, like thinking about how we create the experience for the customer. With the rise of e-commerce, like thinking really in the future further out, how do you think our pricing models are gonna work out? And is there anything we should be thinking about now? <laughs> when we talk about e-commerce, because data, everybody has that fast and knows the price right away. Mm -hmm. Just want to get your thoughts. Um, when it comes to, though, pricing, what's really, really great in e-commerce is you have the ability to test and to resonate, you know, with, like, friendly pricing and, like, the way that, you know, it resonates, you know, with... Um, with currency and with FX and conversion rates, you know, in different markets, different things resonate, right? Like in some markets, you want that 99 at the end. With some, you want a straight dollar sign. So the great thing about e-commerce is the ability to flex and change, even through like automation and being able to understand your, your conversion rates and then be able to flex to that. So I would actually say that your ability to flex your pricing is going to be incredible. Any, honestly, anyone who's doing a really great job online, anyone who's been fast growing, has been doing a really great job for the most part of using their data to test and be agile really quickly and to move online. And that could be with anything from, you know, like styles and product to things like loyalty programs, you know, that are working or even conversion rates and like, you know, adjusting and playing with their, their checkouts to see, you know, what resonates, you know, what's causing friction, when are carts starting to drop. So, you know, anyone who's, you know, you know, who's got some focus on their e-commerce should be looking at all of those things. So with that, thank you so much um, for your attention. Thank you so much for Shimona for joining us. Um, again, we should be really proud that, you know, 
Shopify is a Canadian company doing great things and being thought leaders in, in the e-commerce space. Um, so thanks for your attention and thanks again to Shimona. Thank you.